Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us during Florida Shines Virtual College Week. My name is Nashla Dewari, and I will be facilitating today's session, College Athletics, where you'll learn everything you need to know about becoming an athlete in college and meeting all the requirements while completing your degree. Now, before we begin, I want to go over a few items with you. If you have questions, please put them in the questions section, and we will address them during the live Q&A at the end of the presentation. Closed captioning is provided for this session, and you can click on the link provided in the chat box. The session is recorded, and the recorded, uh, recording along with the materials will be shared on floridashines.org. And finally, we are live on Twitter, so feel free to share your comments and connect with us at FL Shine. Thank you. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Chanda Stebbins. Chanda is a coach at Santa Fe College, and she has been a coach there for the past 15 years. She played volleyball and basketball at the University of Florida. She taught elementary school, and she will be completing her master's in student affairs in December. She has a strong background in education, motivation, health and wellness, and serving students. We are so excited to have her with us today and hear from you, Chanda, on such a popular topic for students. So we thank you for joining us, and the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. And welcome to all of you from Santa Fe College and certainly from Saints Women's Basketball. Um, I'd like to just share with all of you today just a little bit about athletics at the next level. I um, want to start first with um, the first screen, and that's uh, the different divisions that we have um, available for you in athletics, and that is the NCAA, the um, NAIA, and the National Junior College uh, level. And just to kind of reach out to all of you um, in Florida, those three levels um, certainly have different levels within them. Um, the NCAA is typically what we think of um, within uh, like Florida, Florida State, and um, Miami. There we go. And um, those NCAA schools are split into three divisions, Division One, I, Division Two, and Division Three. Typically, Division One is what most of us see on TV um, in football and those kind of things. Division Two, a lot of us, we don't see those on TV. We'll talk a little bit about some of those schools in a minute. And Division III typically don't offer athletic scholarships, but a lot of those Division III institutions do have athletics. Um, NAIA are oftentimes your private schools, um, and we do have some of those in Florida, which are, are great situations, and we'll talk some about those. And then NJCA actually has two divisions. Division I NJCA schools often have um, scholarships that cover most everything, and Division II NJCA schools um, oftentimes have scholarships that cover a lot of things but cannot cover housing. So it's important for you to understand the different levels. I'll hear a lot of student athletes say, or high school athletes say, oh, you know, I want to go D1 or I want to I want to go uh, to this level or I want to go to that level. And there are some really redeeming qualities about all three of these levels and then redeeming qualities about all the levels within each of these different um, areas. So. Um, we'll talk about each of those in a second. Now let's just make sure we're on the same page here. And again, feel free to type any questions you have um, regarding anything I might say. I, my goal today is to make sure to get you as much information as possible so that as you have questions, as you're moving through with a student, if you're a guidance counselor or if you're a student athlete or if you're a, a parent, that as you move through the process of perhaps looking into um, moving on to the next level, you have some resources and ways to get some questions answered. Some useful definitions that you probably need to know. The NCAA has a clearinghouse, and um, that clearinghouse is accessible by clicking on here. Um, okay. Um, apparently, this 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 link isn't live right now. Um, but if you Google NCAA Clearinghouse, um, you will you will be able to get to the NCAA Clearinghouse. I'm not sure why this link isn't working. Um, maybe one of our, our friends can help us here. Um, but um, if you Google the Clearinghouse, you'll be able to get a, a look at what they're requiring. And um, 
they're going to ask you to log in. Probably the most important thing for student athletes to understand and guidance counselors to understand is that they're going to require, there we go, they're going to require students to pay a fee. And if you're on free and reduced lunch at the high school level, um, that fee can be waived. And so guidance counselors, um, you guys can help your student athletes get that fee waived while they're in high school. Uh, one other key about this website that's important is anybody can click on this high school administrator's link right here. Um, okay, and um, if you click on that link, um, it'll take you to a, a, an area that you can check and see what high school coursework is actually available uh, and what courses within your high school are eligible for um, for translation in the NCAA level. So you want to make sure at your high school that you're taking uh, courses that are core credit. Um, and so um, that link is a live link and you can, you can actually put your high school uh, name in and make sure that your high school is registered with NCAA. If you are at a, a FHSAA public high school, your, um, I'd say 99% of those high schools are already registered. If you're at a, a private high school in the state of Florida, um, obviously if you're a guidance counselor, that would be your your uh, duty to try, you know, to get on there and get um, enrolled. But if you're a student or a parent of a student, then um, that might be something you want to check with your high school to make sure that they're enrolled with the NCAA. This uh, screen that you see up now is the initial eligibility which is our, our next um, link here. And the thing that you uh, kind of need to see on this, if you scroll down a little bit, is the core course requirement and the test um, requirement for incoming student athletes. And um, the Division I core requirements are four years of English and, um, and then 16 core courses all together. And that previous screen that I was going to show you guys that you can link on to your, your high school, that will tell you how many um, of your courses at your particular high school, and again, this would be relevant just to you, and, and again, that's why it's important for you to, on your own time, to look up that high school, um, is to um, see how many of your um, high school credits will carry over. And your guidance counselor can do that with you, um, because the Division One and the Division Two, yeah, right here on this high school administration link, um, your high school um, administrator can help you walk through that. And of course, you can do all of this before the NCAA either deems you eligible or not eligible. Um, yes, thank you. And if you click right here on um, uh, in list of NCAA, yep, and then uh, you're gonna actually um, resources, you can, you can look up your high school and look it up based on your high school's name. And um, you don't have to be a guidance counselor to do that. And of course, obviously, guidance counselors, you can look up a certain course right away, and, and probably many of you guidance counselors already do that. And um, this would be really important if you're trying to decide what courses to take maybe through a, a virtual a virtual school experience. Um, I'm sorry, if you go to um, resources and then click on login um, and and we can we can go back to the we can go back to the uh, PowerPoint Th thank you guys I appreciate it um, the the Shanda, point for um, I, go ahead I'm sorry we're clicking back and say, <laughs> I was gonna say we are happy to drive if you'd let us know where to go we're happy to be the drivers here on our end for you okay, okay. So um, for high school guidance counselors and students, the important thing, and you'll be able to see once you start to navigate that, because um, I know I'm jumping around a little bit too much for you guys. So just to understand, when you go to the Clearinghouse website, just understand the high school administrator, even though you may not be an administrator, you can click on that and you can actually look up your high school without necessarily putting any login information. And that's the point I want to make about that, that link. Um, the initial eligibility link, the, the uh, PDF that they had up earlier, the point about that is understand that Division I requires 16 core courses. Um, when you look at Division II, they're going to require a little bit less. And um, so that's the 
differentiation between Division I qualifier and a Division II qualifier. Um, the Division I will go with a sliding scale, which some of you have probably heard of before, and a sliding scale simply means that your ACT or SAT score is going to be um, need to be higher if your GPA is lower, and if your GPA is higher, your ACT score can be a little bit lower. Um, so I want to also point out here on the right of, of this NCAA, um, a lot of people say, well, you know, my sliding score test score is a little too low. I'm only a D2 qualifier. If you take a look at some of your D2 institutions in the state of Florida, and obviously I've only listed the Sunshine State Conference, St. Leo, Rawlings, Florida Institute of Technology, Lynn, Nova Southeastern Barry, um, Florida Southern, you have a, a ton of really solid institutions in the state of Florida, in addition to the flag st Flagstaff institutions that many of us see on TV every weekend. And so I would just uh, remind you, no matter what sport you play, uh, do your due diligence, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute, in looking at all your institutions. There are a lot of private and state institutions that are very solid. And um, regardless of what sport you play, it's very important to have an idea of what you want to major in because some institutions are, are better in certain majors than others. But again, we can talk about that in a second. We'll move on to the NAIA now. And um, on the NAIA page, uh, their definitions of uh, what make, meets eligibility, again, are a little bit different. We can go to that clearinghouse on the NAIA page. Thanks, guys. Um, the NAI uh, also has their own clearinghouse. You will have to pay for that as well. They also have um, a similar fee waiver that the NCAA does, and we're not going to click on any links on this one, but they also have like the high school administrators and counselors links. They have a different um, area for the, the U.S. students and the international students. Um, and then at the, the nice thing about the high school and administrators link for, for this one is they have really good videos um, and uh, eligibility uh, information. So these are things that you can show your students. If you are a student and you're on here or you're a parent, these are areas that you can go and get more information about the NAIA. So again, clicking on high school administrator, um, not necessarily now, but you know, uh, when you're at home would be a, a good um, option for more information as far as the NAIA is concerned. And if we want to go back to um, the, the PowerPoint and click on initial eligibility and then go to page four of that, that would be fabulous. Um, the, the NAI for initial eligibility also is a little bit different. They have like a three-pronged approach that you need to um, get two out of the three prongs, and it's, it's page four. Uh, so you're going to slide down to page four. Um, for the NAI, they look at um, things that are rel relative to your high school. So like, were you in the top half of your high school? Um, I, I believe it's up a little bit, guys. I think you went too far. Um, they look at if you were in the top half of your high school, for example. They look at if you were, um, if, if you, I believe it's your SAT and ACT scores, and then your GPA. Um, uh, yeah, keep going up a little bit. And we're moving, Hannah, we're moving up, so we'll do the driving for you. We're moving up right up to page four for you, so you can show that. Thank you. Yep. And just so you know, while they're doing that, a couple um, NAI schools in the state of Florida, Southeastern University, Florida Memorial, Ed Waters, Weber International, um, I've had kids uh, go to all of those schools and have good experiences. Uh, typically, one thing that unites the, the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics is um, they're able to sort of brand their their uh, athletics to like champions of character. So they sort of try to um, go after a different kind of uh, mantra. Sometimes they're Christian schools, um, sometimes they're uh, HBCUs, like uh, sometimes they uh, tend to be smaller or, um, or a, uh, a really um, special um, orientation that they're going after. 
um, and we can keep going up just a little bit. It's a it's a chart on page four. There we go, right there, right there. So they have a, a three-pronged approach. You have to meet two of them, the test score requirement, so a minimum of uh, 16 on the ACT and 860 on the SAT, um, a minimum overall high school GPA of a 2.0, or graduate in the top half of your high school class. So as you can see, their, um, their approach is a little bit different than the NCAA's approach. And um, for everyone, it's a little bit different. And obviously, transfer requirements are different for everybody. Um, and they have different requirements for GED students, which are students who graduate with their um, general uh, education diploma. And then homeschooled students are a little bit different. And then obviously, international students are a little bit different. Now, if we move on to our, our third um, group of institutions, that's our National Junior College um, Athletic uh, Association. And the nice thing about the NJCA is there is no clearinghouse. Um, all of our uh, National Junior College Athletic Association institutions academically have an open access um, policy. That means that there are no um, entrance policies. Uh, anyone can attend. Um, it's just a matter of what you take once you actually enroll at those institutions. In order to participate in athletics, however, at a National Junior College Athletic Association um, institution, you would have to complete your GED or um, receive your high school diploma. That is what would gain you initial eligibility. There is no initial eligibility requirement of an SAT or an ACT score. Um, dependent upon the institution and the requirements of that institution, you may be asked to take a college placement test to determine what level of coursework you may be taking at that high school. Typically in the state of Florida, if you have graduated from a, um, a Florida public high school, you can exempt out of college developmental education or you can choose to take that if that's what your test score indicates is necessary. Um, if you click on our, our Florida College um, State um, Activity Association logo, we'll show you some of your junior colleges here in the state of Florida. Um, and, oh, we went to the next screen here. Um, if we can, yeah, click on the Florida logo there. Um, in the state of Florida, we have a number of, we have 28 junior colleges. Not all of them offer, um, not all of them. That's a little bit different screen that, than I'm used to seeing, but um, we're missing the, the logo of, of all the colleges. But um, there we go, yep. The college logos aren't up there. Um, but we have, uh, colleges all over the state, obviously, and then if you want to click on athletics, we can skip highlighting the colleges, um, but we'll, if you click on each women's sports and men's sports, we'll give them a look on what sports. So we have baseball, basketball, cross country, golf, soccer, swimming, and diving, and tennis, and then on the women's side of things, we have basketball, cross country, golf, soccer, softball, swimming, diving, tennis, and volleyball. If you go back to men's sports, I know we may have some football guys in the house wondering why isn't there football? Um, in the state of Florida, the junior college system is not allowed to have uh, football. If you go down to non-FCSAA sports, you'll notice that ASA, which is not a, a Florida college systems institution, has uh, football. And, um, you know, we don't need to click on that or anything, but they um, do host football. They're the only institution, and they're not a, a Florida College System institution. So, um, you know, they operate a little bit differently than Florida College System institutions, but they do have football as a two-year institution. Um, the most important thing to take out of the NJCA um, definitions is that there is no entrance requirement other than your high school diploma or your GED and the initial eligibility for a junior college athlete is graduation from high school. So you can enter um, as, a, as a graduating high school senior and play immediately at a, as a freshman in um, a junior college institution. So again, if you have um, entrance or eligibility questions, you can type those in. We're gonna move on to our next, um, next uh, slide 
which really has to do with, okay, so now I understand um, about the next level. What do I do if I want to go to the next level? So it's really important, no matter what you're going to do, if you're going to go to the next level, it's really important to finish your junior, senior year really strong academically. Uh, we have a lot of kids that um, maybe, you know, kind of slack off their senior year, kind of get a little bit of senioritis. Um, just realize that everything you're building on right now as a junior and a senior are things you're going to do down the road. So your algebra, your histories, your Englishes, those are things you're going to revisit your freshman and senior year, uh, I'm sorry, your freshman and sophomore year of college. So um, this isn't the last time you'll see algebra, unfortunately. It's not the last time you'll write a paper. So finish strong your, your junior and senior year of, of high school. I, th I believe you um, already had an opportunity to listen to some, um, some information about Bright Futures. The one thing I would warn you about that is a lot of times people will say, well, I'm going to get an athletic scholarship. I don't need to fill out the Bright Futures. Um, if you get an athletic scholarship, you can get your Bright Futures money back as um, a, an expense that you can use on living expenses. So just make sure you fill out Bright Futures. And also, if, if you know two years down the road you decide not to play sports, you will want that Bright Futures money um, to pay for tuition. So it's always better to fill it out and then not need it than to not fill it out. And obviously, always complete the FAFSA. Um, which is federal uh, financial aid. Remember, you should never have to pay to fill out the FAFSA. So hopefully you have some other presenters, and, and I know you guys are going to post some of that information, um, so I don't have to cover much of that. Um, now let's get on to the good stuff about being a recruit. I often get asked, no matter what sport it is, you know, do I have to, do I have to play AAU? In the state of Florida, Obviously, football is, is a really premier sport, and so probably one of the most important things you can do from a football standpoint is make sure you're involved with your high school team, play spring football, be involved in summer workouts. As far as your other sports like basketball and um, soccer and some of those, being involved in your club programs and your AAU programs, um, is it required? Well, you know, it's probably not required if you're a great athlete. But one of the reasons I say that it's a great recommendation and most coaches put a lot of weight into it is because one thing that AAU or club seasons do for athletes is they get them a lot of games. And so just participating and being involved and getting a lot of activity and, and play is really good for athletes. Um, what's negative for athletes, in my opinion, of course, I played two sports at a Division One level and um, was a three-sport all-state a high school athlete is that I think the more sports that you can play, not be inundated, you know, to the point you're running three practices a day, but I, I think it makes you a more versatile athlete. And so specializing too young, I would, I would not recommend, but um, being able to, to be involved and um, play uh, sports. And you know, even if it's just out in the yard or at the playground, um, is, is really important. So that's why I would recommend AAU. Do I recommend playing two, three grand uh, a month to, to play it? I mean, I think that's a little bit over the top. So I know that's a vague answer, but those are my thoughts with regard to AAU. Um, I also, also get asked the question a lot, my high school coach and I don't get along. Is that a problem? Here's my thoughts on that. Yes, it's a problem. Um, find a way to get along with your high school coach. Most high school coaches, um, everyone's got personality differences, but find a way to get along with your high school coach. Um, most of the time they're coaching because they love the sport. They want to help you become a better person. They want to help you become a better player, better uh, student, better athlete. So um, listen to them. They oftentimes have your best interests in mind. So yes, find a way to um, listen to what they have to say, maybe not always to the way they're saying it, but find a way to hear what they're saying and what they mean. Um, another question I hear is, well, you know, how important are my stats? My coach doesn't play me enough, or I don't think I shoot enough. Um, you know, I think I go to a ton of high school games, and I'm oftentimes looking at things like footwork. What's the, what's the player doing when she's away from the ball? Um, what's her body language like in timeouts? Um, how does she treat her teammates? Um, is her is her eye contact on her coach? Is she always complaining to the officials? So I think stats are eye-catching and stats are good, 
but they certainly don't tell the whole story. So if I were you, I would really work on things like your left hand, uh, things like being a complete athlete, um, things that make you a well-rounded person and things that make your transcript solid um, and uh, the stats will probably happen on their own. All right, so in the process of being recruited, um, you know, it's really important, I think, for um, parents and students to find that, that good balance between who's in charge, the parent or, or the student. I think college coaches, when they're recruiting um, kids, they, they sometimes get turned off by parents that are over-controlling or parents that uh, want to, you know, be in charge of everything because, after all, when their student comes to college, the, the, the coach is going to be dealing with the, with the student, not with the parent. And so I think parents have to, have to walk that fine line between allowing their student to be recruited and also um, guiding their, their child in the recruiting process. Um, with that said, I think parents also need to be careful how, how they behave. I've known a lot of coaches that stopped recruiting a student because of the way parents acted in the stands. Um, Students, you know, I think you have to be aware um, that the reason your parents do get involved in recruiting is because you're quiet and don't ask enough questions. So, you know, maybe sitting down with your parents and talking about some good brainstorming, some good questions you might want to ask on campus visits will be important. Some of the best questions I tell my players to ask are not, do you like it here or what do you think, but very pointed questions like, you know, what happens? the day after a loss, or um, how diverse is your campus, or, you know, what is your campus like when it's quiet, or, um, you know, how many morning classes do you have, or how much running do you have, or what does a wait day look like? Um, As you begin to ask questions about the campus, or about practices, or about the coaching staff, or about how their program is run, keep those questions and keep logs of those um, of those dialogues. That way you can sort of start to ask similar questions to each of the programs that are recruiting you. Um, it's difficult if certain programs are recruiting you and you're asking each program different questions, it'll be difficult in the end to compare them because you'll be comparing um, different questions. So I just would recommend, you know, start coming up with um, questions that you think fit for what you want. So that kind of leads us to the to the next slide. I always tell my players, before you get to the point of making a decision, start choosing what would be the top 10 characteristics that would be the right fit for you, um, which is on the next slide. So for my students, I have some students that say, you know, coach, one of the top 10 characteristics for me is I, I've got to go to a school that um, is in, you know, a metropolitan area or coach, I'm okay with a school that's in, you know, the country or um, I absolutely know that I want to major in nursing. So coach, I've got to go to a school that has a pretty strong healthcare uh, major. Um, And, you know, if you're a high school junior, you may, you may not know what you want to major in. That's okay. Um, But start jotting down some things that are really important to you. Um, And parents, you can help with this. Um, by reflecting to your student, well, you know, you seem to you seem to kind of stay at home a lot on the weekends. Um, you know, you don't have to say to your student, well, you know, you're kind of a homebody, but you might say to them, how important is it to you to, you know, be able to go out um, and, and party? You know, um, how important is it to you to be able to stay at home? Okay, well, if staying at home is important, then maybe dorms would be a, a good place to start. You know, um, having a nice dorm situation would be um, important to your student. If your student is always happen to be around people and, you know, do things, then maybe a bigger campus setting would be good. So you might want to ask questions about what student life is like at that institution. Are there activities? Are there student organizations that would be of interest to your to your child? If your child is one of those students or if you yourself are one of those students that is involved in a lot of high school clubs, then you might want to ask what clubs are available at the institution you're looking at. If you're a person that enjoys diversity and you like being around a lot of different people, not just racially, but maybe people that have a lot of different interests, 
then when you visit the school, you need to look and see, are there people that look different than you? Are there people that appear to have different things that they like than you? Are there, is the school have a lot of different um, majors? Are there things that make the school look and feel um, like it's accepting of different things or does the school look pretty homogeneous? And nothing's the matter with any of those different takes unless it's totally different than what you want. Um, so as you're starting to make these decisions and choices, try to avoid making emotional decisions. So, oh, this just feels right is a lot of times what we hear and that kind of makes us nervous because, you know, um, something might feel right today, but it may not be right tomorrow. Um, so, and the last thing that I really tell uh, our students is make sure you consider the school minus the sport. So, if you were to, to lose all the air in the basketball tomorrow um, and there was no basketball, would you still be happy at the school? Would you be happy um, in that major? Would you be happy in that dorm? Would you be happy surrounded by the people that you're surrounded by? Would you be happy if there was or wasn't a Walmart close by? Would you be happy if there was or wasn't an airport close by? Like what would your comfort level be if there were no sport there? And a lot of kids will say, well, you know, I'll always have my sport. And, and I, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm going to take that away from you. I'm just recommending that there will be bad days within, if you play college athletics, there will be days when you lose a game and it'll feel like the worst day in your, your life. There will be days when you win and it'll be great, but you're going to need to have a life outside that sport. And so your institution academically, socially, the, the things that the institution puts around you are going to make the biggest difference. So as you're evaluating institutions, make sure you look at those things um, and not just maybe the whether it's a Nike or Adidas school or whether the uniforms are the color you like or, or whether the coach just seems to be the best person in the world or not. So those are some things to think about. I'm more than open to any questions that, that people may have. Um, and I, I hope that I've covered enough things to at least get some people thinking. Um, thoughts, questions? Thank you, Chanda. Yeah, like you said, I'd like to invite our audience now to send any questions you have for Chanda, and let me just say that while we're pre preparing for those questions, we have shared the links uh, in the chat box, and we will also have a copy of this presentation available with all the links after uh, the session. So if you miss any of them, either find them in the chat section, or you will have a copy of uh, the presentation from today with those. And I just wanted to thank you for sharing this information with us today. It really is not only about being a good athlete, but meeting the eligibility, eligibility requirements, qualifying, there's a lot of focus on the academics, balancing the training and life in general. So lots to think yep. about uh, to become yep. an athlete in college. Chanda, our first question is uh, related to eligibility. Uh, according to the Florida High School Athletic Association, uh, the student is not eligible to play basketball during their senior year of high school. Can they still play in college? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, it, whether they play in high school or not does not affect whether they play in college. So you, if, if you don't play on a single team at all in high school, you can still play in college. So college eligibility is different than high school eligibility. Um, now, let's be a realistic. If they, were not, if they were not meeting eligibility in high school, there was probably a reason why they weren't meeting eligibility. So maybe their GPA wasn't high enough or maybe they didn't have enough credits. So let's, let's just pretend hypothetically they didn't have enough credits to play in high school. Well, as we just went through, then they may not have enough, maybe they graduate from high school, but they may not have enough credits NCAA-wise to meet those 16 core credits to be eligible at an NCAA school. Um, however, if they graduate from a high school, even though they, didn't, they weren't eligible to play FHSAA, but they graduate from a Florida high school, they, and they enroll in a junior college, technically they could meet eligibility requirements to play in JCAA. 
Um, so yes, technically they could. Um, you know, so um, absolutely they could. I would just warn if that's a student asking, I would absolutely warn that student really work on necess not necessarily you may not be able to meet those requirements in to, to play um, depending upon where your where your requirement problems are. You may not be able to meet those requirements to play, let's say, basketball this year if you're a senior, but really try to remediate those needs because, like I said, everything's going to build on itself. So let's say you're struggling in math and that's the problem. You're, you're just not getting through senior math and so you're behind in credits. You're going to need to understand that math stuff to be able to get through it in college. So the same problems you're struggling with now, you're going to be struggling in at some point at the next level. But technically, you could still be eligible. Does that answer it? Yeah, thank you so much. That is um, very clear to reiterate. It does not affect um, your college career if you're not um, playing Correct. in high school. But like you said, lots of components to consider that you have to meet uh, for eligibility. So thank you. We will make sure that that attendee gets that information. The other question, um, Tanda, is related to AAU. Is it better if you play uh, for AAU? Does it benefit you in any way? Well, like I said, I mean, AAU, I think the benefit of playing AAU is just the the ability to play and to get the game time and to be on the floor in the summer and to get reps both in practice and in five on five settings. Um, it's better than, you know, laying around and doing nothing all summer. The downside of playing AAU is, um, you know, you're playing basketball for nine, 10 months of the year and you're not playing any other sports. So if you play AAU at the expense of playing no other sports and you're specializing, um, you know, as an eighth grader and you do no, no other sports, I think that that may hurt you a little bit in the long run from an injury standpoint, from a, uh, you know, um, versatility standpoint. But I think if you can limit that to, you know, and, and give yourself time to recover, um, AAU obviously is a big part of development. And then the other thing I would say is really making sure that you play for an AAU program that stresses skill development, um, stresses uh, becoming not just, uh, you know, better at just playing pickup, but actually developing your IQ and your skill development. And certainly that would be in basketball and uh, in, in other sports, I'm sure skill development's a big deal too, but I know football's just a whole different beast. Thank you, Chanda. Uh, and our last question of the evening is related to maybe a good place to start. How would we find a school in Florida that offers perhaps specific programs? So this particular question is related to a DISCUS program. How would they find a school that offers that program or that sport? I'm sorry, what was the sport? DISCUS. DISCUS for track and field? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, that's okay. Me, so no, that's okay. Help. Yeah. So um, I'm assuming, let's say we have a high school student athlete that you know is looking for a discus scholarship. Um, I think that probably the first place we would look um, would be your track and field programs, and I would look at your Division II, um, obviously your Division One programs, and then the website that we went to with the NJCAA. You can look under track and field, which it looks like. That's a non-sanctioned FCSA, uh, FCSAA program. So that would be under um, that third tag that we looked at. Depending on whether it's a male or a female, then you would need to obviously look whether it's a male or female sport. Um, but, you know, um, depending on how good the student is, one of the things I would probably recommend to that person is, let's say, if they're from the Orlando area, maybe look up um, one of the, the smaller uh, D2 schools in the Orlando area, check with a track coach in that area. And uh, that's one of the other things I would say is, no matter what sport it is, but in this particular person's question, I don't think there's anything the matter with that student athlete, if they're a junior or senior, shooting that track coach a, an email and just saying, you know, my name is Joe Smith and um, I throw discus for, you know, Orlando High School and 
I'm just interested in finding out more information about your program. Um, how would I go about, um, you know, um, getting some information to you about my abilities or my skill level? Um, and, you know, they may or may not hear back from them, but at least they've, you know, made some headway. And a lot of times, uh, at least, you know, a lot of us coaches, we have a lot of connections. And so just put, putting your name out there and talking to some people, he may or she may not be able to help you, but they may know somebody else who may need a discus thrower. And so, um, but again, I think it's always good to hear from the student. Um, a lot of us are more inclined to reply to the student. And, and one other thing I would say about that, if I may, is, a lot of people ask me, should I sign up for these national scouting services that people are always telling me to pay for? Um, don't have a problem with them, but I would just tell you, I think most of us probably can, you know, shoot an email to um, the schools in our region if we have a son or a daughter interested in a certain sport just as quick as we can probably, you know, pay for a, a service like that. So, and it's probably a little bit more intimate, a little bit more personal. So I'd probably... If I was a parent, I'd probably try that route before I'd pay for a, a scouting service. But again, that's just my opinion. Shanna, and you mentioned this earlier, and I think you were um, answering this question. But just to reiterate for our audience, a question came in related to those letters of interest you were talking about. So are letters of interest to coaches typically recommended? Our interest is, should, should parents email a letter of interest to the coach? Is that what you just asked? Yeah, and the question doesn't say whether it's a letter of interest from the parent or the student, but are they the same? Which one is more recommended? Okay. Sure. So here's what I recommend. I I am always extremely pleased and and very interested when I receive a very well written and a very mature letter from a student. Um, so I recommend a parent, a high school coach, a guidance counselor assist a student with a with a well-written not extremely lengthy but also not you know hey i'm interested <laughs> like text lowercase you know um help the student and use it as a teachable moment help the student um you know write a great uh, email to let's say a coach like me and explain hey I am really interested. I want to introduce myself. I'm so and so. I, I play basketball at this institution. Uh, give that uh, coach enough details that they can look you up. Perhaps even include a video link. Um, and it come. It needs to come from the student because again, the coach is going to be coaching the student. But um, you know, I would highly recommend a parent, guidance counselor, coach help that student really make it a professional email. Make it sound good. Um, put that best foot forward and teach the student how to put the best foot forward. I think a lot of times we either do one or the other. We we send a really professional email from a parent and, you know, that turns coaches off or we just tell our students just, oh, go send the coach an email. And, you know, the student sends it like they're sending a text message to their buddy and it, it comes off the wrong way. So, you know, I think we can use that as a teachable moment with our students to send a really nice professional a well-written email to the coach, um, including, you know, their stats and, and maybe even including their coach's email or, or maybe a CC to their parent and their coach so that, um, you know, it shows that, that their their student is on top of things. So I highly recommend that. And I think it always makes that student kind of stand out separate from uh, students whose stuff comes to me from a scouting service or a student who's, whose stuff comes to me from a parent. So, um, you know, I, that kind of always makes me think, gosh, this kid kind of seems like they have it together. Yeah, it's always good to know um, interest directly from the students, like you said, Chanda. So if there's any other questions, we'll certainly, if you don't mind, connect the audience uh, directly with you. But I want to thank you for sharing such a wealth of resources and tips and just a big picture of what it means to be a student athlete today. So thank you again. Uh, as a reminder to our audience, the recorded session, along with any materials and links shared today, will be posted on floridashines.org. Now, if you'd like to learn more about college success, financial aid, and what parents can do 
to help in the college process, join us tomorrow for an ent entire new series of live webinars and new topics during Virtual College Week. You can sign up for those topics at virtualcollegeweek.org. And again, thank you, Chanda, and thank you all for joining us. You're welcome.